can I start by thanking everyone who signed the petition uh, for enabling us to have this debate today and also to pay tribute to the range of organisations that work in this field, many of whom have been doing so for decades, like the Electoral Reform Society, Make Votes Matter, which is a younger organisation, and Unlock Democracy, and in particular to thank the members of the Merseyside Unlock Democracy, who I have the pleasure to work with on a regular basis on this and other issues. I want to start with something where I very much agree with the Honourable Gentleman, and that is there is no such thing as an ideal electoral system. What we are all seeking to do is to balance competing criteria to try to fashion the system that is best for the circumstances of our country. And having debate, been debating this issue over the years, I'm very familiar, as we heard earlier, with Italy often being cited as an example of a country that has PR that hasn't been very successful. And then those on our side of the argument will counter with Germany as, I think, a great example where the proportional voting system has been part of the reason for that country's success over the last 70 years. But I think we should agree amongst ourselves that we are debating different criteria. One of those criteria, I think, is fairness. And to answer the very fair challenge that the Honourable Gentleman finished with, fairness for whom? Democracy for whom? For me, it's for the people. It's for the voters. And the reason that I'm in favour of a broadly proportional system, I'm not a purist, I don't want to adopt the Israeli system where it's almost precise proportional representation, but broadly proportional system, is that I think in our political situation now, the system doesn't work anymore. And we've heard during this debate, and we've long heard during debates on this issue, one of the main arguments given in support of First Past the Post is that it delivers a clear majority for the party that comes first, and that enables them to govern. And my honourable friend rightly reminded us of the anomalous elections where even that wasn't the case, 1951, February 1974. But I think there is a more powerful point, which is that the fundamentals of our voting have changed in this country. If you look at 1945 to 1970, at every single one of those general elections, well over 90% of those who voted, voted either Conservative or Labour. It really was a two party system. And since 1974, essentially we have a system that is more diverse, more pluralistic, more fragmented than it was before and therefore more volatile. And I think it is relevant to say that two of the last three general elections have resulted in hung parliaments. Now that might be anomalous, it might turn out that we return in future elections, we'll elect five majority Labour governments in a row, that would be great by me. But I suspect that the pluralism and the volatility of the previous few decades may well be with us to stay. And therefore, a system that might have been okay for the 50s and 60s when you had that uh, vast majority of people who voted, voting Labour or Conservative, isn't, I think, right for the world that we live in now. A number of points have been raised during the debate I'd like to very briefly respond to. I think a point was made earlier about tactical voting. And why is it that tactical voting uh, is um, something that we decry and yet parties use it? Well, I think that's just a reality of working within the system that we've got. I'm delighted to have my very good friend, the uh, member for Enfield Southgate next to me. He and I campaigned together 20 years ago in Enfield Southgate to win that seat for Labour for the first time. And we were absolutely clear in saying to Liberal Democrat voters and Green voters and others, if you want to defeat Michael Portillo, only a Labour vote will count. And it works. But you shouldn't have a system where you are actively having to encourage that and support that kind of negative style of campaign. I want a system where Liberal Democrats in Enfield Southgate can vote Liberal Democrat. Green voters in those constituencies can vote Green. Labour voters in areas where it's Liberal Democrat versus Conservative can vote Labour. And that, for me, is one of the most powerful arguments in favour of electoral reform, ensuring that the voter, wherever he or she lives, is able to cast their vote by conviction rather than casting their vote on the basis of tactics. And we know all of the parties do this. There is a targeting of a relatively small number of seats and then within those seats, a targeting of a relatively small number of voters. And all of us in the recent election will have spent time, I'm sure, yes, in our own constituencies, but also campaigning elsewhere because it's a relatively small number of seats that determines the outcome of an election. I think that is very, very unhealthy for those who are living, the voters who are living in those constituencies that are not then the targets. The final point I want to make is the Honourable Gentleman um, for... Um, uh, Newquay and St Austell, when he opened the speech, opened the debate, made a very important point, which is that this is not a silver bullet. 
And I think those of us who favour voting reform have to be careful sometimes not to present it as some panacea for all of the ills of our democracy or even of our wider society. I think it's incredibly important that we see this in a context of a broader set of social and economic and political challenges. For me, it is important that we have a package of democratic reforms that addresses the democratic deficit that we still have in our system. And I was delighted that the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Crawley, spoke about uh, the, elect, the need to elect the Second Chamber and that proportional representation could be used in order to achieve that. I'm delighted that my Honourable Friend from Oldham West has a private member's bill this Friday to lower the voting age to 16. I think we need to go back to the question of citizenship education in our schools and what can be done to equip the voters of the future. I think our devolution settlement in England is something that needs serious attention because it's hugely my, my variable point. between different parts of the country. I mean, just just on, on, the, on the point of devolution, uh, we, we do have uh, proportional representation in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and also in London, and it works very well. People understand it, and it is delivering good government in all those regions. I, I, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend, and I, I absolutely agree, and I concur with those who've said during this debate that we really can learn lessons from the experience of those broadly proportional voting systems in Scotland, in Wales, and as he rightly reminds us, in uh, Greater London. And we did hear earlier the suggestion that those systems in England should be abandoned and we should move to a first-past-the-post system. I actually think it's hugely helpful in the Greater London Assembly that you have a range of parties represented. You know, minority parties in London, like the Conservatives, can have a voice <laughs> in uh, the Assembly. I think there's a serious risk. I I said that expecting to elicit a laugh, but, but it's a serious point, which is actually, on the last elections, I think I'm right in saying, if you had first past the post, which I understand is the Conservative manifesto position, you would have a clear Labour majority in the London Assembly. And actually, I think, particularly when the Mayor is Labour, it's right that the other voices of citizens in London, the other parties in London, uh, the Conservatives, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens and others, are also represented there, holding the Mayor to account. My final point is this. There is a risk, this is a Westminster bubble debate held amongst us as members of parliament, many of us rehearsing arguments we've been having for many, many years. I think we need to take this debate out of here. It needs to be a debate out there in the country. I still think the idea of some kind of democratic convention, some kind of citizens convention to look at these issues would be welcome. I think that played a very productive role over two decades ago in Scotland as the devolution settlement was being framed back in the 1990s. Citizens need to have their say. And that, for me, comes back to this question of the system. I think, rather than the system being something we dream up amongst the politicians, let's engage citizens. Let's see how they want to balance proportionality versus strong government, voter choice, all of the different factors. Because I'm confident that if we allow citizens through a convention to do that, they will come back with a different system to the one we have now. But they won't necessarily want to import a system from another country they'll devise a system that is suited to the particular history and the traditions of democracy in this country. So I welcome this debate and finish really where I started, Mr Gray, which is to thank those uh, over 100,000 people who petitioned us and enabled this important issue to be discussed. Yeah, yeah.